welcome, welcome to, to STEM, STEM Culture. Oh, I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have an intro. Yeah, it's really warm in here. <laughs> welcome to STEM Culture Podcast. Today, we're talking about something different than usual. Considering some extreme circumstances, and unfortunately, Danny and I have had to seize creative control of STEM Culture Podcast. We felt this necessary considering the state of the world right now. It's very early in the morning. We first forced Kaylee to help us organize the coup. And we're here to bring our graduate student demands to you. Demand number one. April, April Fools! Fools. <laughs> <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> All right. <clears throat> Today you have Danny. Will. And Kaylee. On this InSTEM episode, where we are going to talk about conversations with our families about our PhD work and life. This episode goes out to all the grad students who don't know how to even begin explaining their research in grad school to their families. You aren't alone. First, we'll introduce the questions we intended to ask our families. Then we'll hear snippets from each of our families and react to those conversations. We began this experiment following conversations between us about how it would be interesting to do an episode featuring our families and how they view our careers. We set up a plan and went forth, sure that it was going to yield fantastic audio. We had a set of questions to ask each of our families. They were, one, if you had to describe what I do, what my life looks like, what would you say? What do you think I do every day at my university? What do you think my life is like as a graduate student? Two, can you describe or explain my research back to me? Three, what questions do you still have about my life as a grad student? Are there any you've been nervous to ask me? Four, as a parent or sibling or etc., what are your biggest concerns for my future? What don't you worry about? But as it goes with families, the conversations didn't go exactly how we expected. And as we discussed what came of our family dialogues, we realized that we're, there were still some parallels to our conversations. First, though, we want to give you some background on our families and the audio we will be sharing. I spoke to my parents and my grandparents after dinner during Christmas break. Between the four of them, they cast a really wide net of understanding and familiarity with STEM. I did interviews with my mom and dad separately. Uh, my mom is a medical doctor and my dad is an academic scientist. And I interviewed my brother. He's three years older than me, and we used to pick each other, pick on each other mercilessly when we were growing up. And my brother, Alan, is a mechanic and welder, an all-around MacGyver. As you can hear, our families are all different, and they come to these conversations from very different places. This means that the conversation derailed for everyone in different places, or in the case of Will, it didn't really derail at all. Both of my parents uh, actually had pretty accurate and nuanced ideas about what my PhD research is on. They sort of hit the nail on the head. Um, but they're both, both also aware that they don't know the whole story. Um, their background and their attitude towards science have set them up to understand just how complicated the process of getting a PhD really is. And similar, similarly, uh, when it came to the specifics of my day-to-day -day life, they both got the spirit of the PhD student life, but even they don't really know the specifics of what I do day to day. And this may not be a fair expectation for parents when you have a complicated profession. This is sort of just the quagmire of our modern life, probably. Uh, in the following interviews, mom and dad describe my research to me, uh, and then they tell me what they think my daily life looks like. The interview with my dad took place at a bar, so <laughs> <laughs> please forgive the background noise. Can you explain my research back to me? You're trying to embarrass me here. <laughs> um, no. No, I do. I, um, well, your research has evolved, too. That's true. So when you started off in graduate school, you were focusing in a certain area, and then that evolved. And where you've left me behind is that science has become, has developed 
beyond anything that I have ever been exposed to. So you talk about genetic research, and I understand genetics from the standpoint of, of uh, medical school and, uh, and human genetics, and that's, that's about as far as my... So you have explained to me as best you can about the, um, the scientific model, the models that you are using to investigate the, the, the question that you're trying to answer. And so you're using a plant model and you are designing a, an experiment which utilizes the uh, plant physiology to answer a certain question and then the genetics of that plant and similar plants to, um, I think, to illuminate the, the nature of the evolution of the, the physiology that you're looking at. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's, I think that's uh, actually a pretty good encapsulation of what my ideal career would look like. So uh, when you imagine uh, a day in my life, what does that look like? When I think of what you're doing, I think of you working very hard, doing <laughs> research and trying to get all this information and uh, creating a, an experiment, and the, the concept. And I didn't do this myself. So I, I can't claim first-hand knowledge, but the idea of creating a, a study or creating a, 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 an experiment, uh, the, uh, coming up with a hypothesis to answer a question, I think is, uh, is a wonderful way to live a life. Yeah, so... Uh, do you think you could explain my research to me? <laughs> well, you mean in, in a way that would that you would not laugh at if I said it? <laughs> but, I'm not, yeah, not um, going to laugh at it. I mean, I think. Yeah, I, yeah, think, like, I think you're studying um, the way that different uh, genetic genotypes of plants and things like plants, maybe fungi or something, how they uh, how they spread on uh, continents and across the planet uh, in, in different uh, eras of weather and geography and uh, different physical external conditions and what causes one type to dominate over another and how that influences the overall evolution of them and maybe of the planet. Yep. Is that? Yeah, that's pretty, pretty right on. Okay, well, that means you explained it to me pretty well because I didn't know very much about it. And I see that you wanted me to describe what I think your life looks like right now. Yeah, like, right? What, what do you think I do day to day? Well, since you're pretty heavily involved in your thesis research right now, I would probably <laughs> wager to say that you're pretty preoccupied with it at this point. And you probably wake up thinking about it and probably rarely not think about what your work is doing and uh, where it's going. And I think that's, I think it's a good thing. Now, if you told me that that's true, then I would say I think you're probably on the right track towards finishing your degree. It's kind of a rite of passage, I think, to take ownership of, you take ownership of your research problem. And I remember years before I had a PhD, people would tell me that when you do a thesis, when you do a, a, a PhD, you become the world's expert on one thing. Right. And I think that's kind of true, really. I mean, you, because you, you leave no stone unturned. You, you, you have to understand how your model works, how your code works, how your, what your analytical approximations are, what the weaknesses are of the existing studies, I mean, what studies haven't been done yet, what studies you are doing and what gap they're going to fill in. And then you have to do them and do them right. 
and understand them and express them to other people and it's kind of all consuming I would say. Your mom sounds really lovely. She reminds me a lot of my mom actually. That's really amazing how how r right they seem to get your your research topic. Yeah, well, one of the things that uh, later we got to uh, is that, you know, we talk a lot about my research. And uh, before I was doing research, uh, you know, we talked a lot about science. I mean, my dad being a scientist, you know, I grew up hearing about his research. And so now sort of the, the tables have turned a little bit. <laughs> but it's a process that we were already sort of used to engaging in together. Were you surprised at how on the nose they got it? Or was that kind of like, yeah, no, I expect you guys to know it at this level? No, yeah, I, I sort of didn't remember describing my research in, sort, in that level of detail to them. Um, uh, but maybe that's just because it's sort of like a, a natural mode of interaction for us. Um, and I guess I, either they did their own reading or I did a really good job because they, <laughs> they each of them really nailed uh, a, a, at least a, a sort of compartment of my research in terms of like why I'm doing it, which is, I mean, yeah, I was pretty surprised by that. And what about their description of what your day-to-day -day life was like? Did that feel like pretty on the nose? Yeah, it did. Um, you know, I think when we, when we were posing that question, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that we were thinking more in terms of like the, you know, the routine. Like what mm -hmm. do you do when you get up in the morning? When you go to work, what are you doing when you're at work? Um, and I, I don't, I, you know, my dad may have some concept of at least the modeling part, and they've both done some lab work, but, um, but it seemed to me that they probably don't have a specific detailed idea about what I do day to day. Yeah, it definitely came across as more like hypothetical or like theoretical. Like, yeah. what are you doing in the big scheme of things? Which I think like it's super interesting to hear because I feel like that reflects who you are more of a person. Like you strike me as more of like the theoretical thinking in the big picture kind of way. So it's very indicative that your family would be describing your life in the similar way, like compared to how my family described my day to day was a lot more like, well, you go to work and then you do this and then you do this and then you do this. So it was really interesting to hear, and I think reflective of like, you know, family life. Hmm. Uh, my brother, whose name is Alan, uh, he has ADHD, which is attention deficit hyperactive disorder. And you will hear this in the recording because he gets off track really easily. So what you're going to hear is me trying to pull back his frankly amazing questions to try and answer questions he's asked me before. And then he asks another question. And honestly, it's hilarious how off track we get to the point by the end of the actual interview. And the whole thing was like an hour long. We start talking about griffins. But it's it's tangential. But it's because he's asked so many different questions. That's 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 where we ended up. Whales to griffins, man. So I'm here with my brother, Alan, and uh, I'm Danny. Alan is three years older than me, and we're having this conversation over winter break and trying to figure out uh, what he knows about what I do. So um, what I know is that like um, you study uh, wax plugs that come out of cetaceans or marine mammals. Yeah. And um, I believe you use and like... So these wax plugs grow kind of like rings on a tree with the age of the animal. And you're able to do a chemical analysis of the individual layers to um, get data about the like salinity level of the ocean at a particular period in time. And like how many times like this particular animal has potentially given birth um, along with like, you know, its age. And like you have the potential with like, a large enough sample size to take this um, 
model of the ocean, so to speak, far enough back and like kind of be able to have a better understanding of where the ocean's health, so to say, is going in the future. So you did amazing. The only thing, I don't think at this moment we're able to tell the salinity of the ocean. Any well, that, that was that. just, oh, that was I, I, I picked that because like the ocean is salty. That's the only reason, <laughs> that's the only reason I use that word. Like I'm okay. sure you can use like, you, are you able to like pull out like, you know, carbon content or like any like, like really specific things like that. Like you have like, oh, like in 1987, the ocean had like 0.03% carbon or something yeah. along those lines. So what we can do, and like I said, you did a really great job. So what we can do is we can look at stress hormones and sex hormones. Mm -hmm. One of those being progesterone, which can tell us about pregnancies in these animals. Yeah, so so hormones, um, also stable isotopes, and that can tell us about the diet of these animals. But like, so like carbon-14 has a very specific rate at which it decays and like, I forget where I was going with that train of thought, so let's just move on. <laughs> okay, that's all right. <laughs> um, but yeah, the two stabilized topes uh, most often used for this kind of research is carbon and nitrogen okay. um, and how they vary with each other. Uh, but that's not my research. That's my friend Farzanay's research. Okay. But that is something we can Say do. Say that name again? Farzanay. Okay. Yeah. Well, what, uh, what's the origin? Uh, she's from Iran. Okay. Yeah. It's just a name I've never heard before, so I'm curious. Yeah, well, it's really cute because her, she has a brother and a sister, mm -hmm. and all their names, names start with an F. Okay. And her mom's name also starts with an F. So, so there's, a naming, there's a naming <laughs> scheme. Totally. Yeah. Uh, so what I'll do now is I'll, I'll explain my research from, from my perspective, but I, like I said, you did you did a really great job. M may I ask you a question or two? Yeah. So, um, the, you have fuzz on your face. I'm sure I do. I, I have lots of hairy... It might be toothpaste. This side. Okay. <laughs> Is it still there? I think it's gone now. Okay. Um. So um, your. How far back? What's the oldest sample? Like the oldest date for one of your samples or the earplugs, right? Mm hmm And how far back continuously does your sample set go? And like, are there gaps in it? Yeah. Can't okay. Really, I imagine. Yeah. So, right now we have analyzed more than 30 earplugs okay. from uh now this is now each animal has two earplugs though right so these are earplugs from separate animals correct yes okay. that's right yeah so so there's the capacity for these animals to have an earplug in each ear but a lot of the times when whalers back in the day would collect these earplugs if they got one they were done um so what would the very... whalers use the earplugs for? okay so Okay, let me answer your first question okay. first, and then and then we can kind of okay. go back through the whole history of it. Wow! <laughs> wow! So, uh, uh, Alan so <laughs> is uh, seems like a really uh, enthusiastic and creative person. Yeah, um, he is. He is. I mean, really. Uh, you know, his enthusiasm for your research comes through clearly to me. I was so impressed with cetaceans. Yeah. Like, <laughs> even when like, I talk about your research way more than I probably talk about my own, and I <laughs> don't even use the word cetacean. I'm like, she works at whales and their pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as good, which is so awesome that, like, you know, it's always really impressive when family can, can use the jargon that we throw around. Yeah, and it was from, and he told me this later in the interview, like, the the way he knew all of that was from one conversation we had, wow. like, a year ago, where he had asked me a question about, like, could I use whale earplugs from, like, Japan? And I had to tell him, well, no, we can't because there's ethical concerns because Japan is whaling outside of the global moratorium that started in the 1980s. So ethically, we really shouldn't use those earplugs. And he remembered all of that just from that conversation where I told him about my research. I was really impressed. Yeah, there was, I mean, a lot of detail there. And, you know, he, he was thinking about, you know, what some of the potential outcomes and impacts of your ability to access this record yeah was. yeah i was like do you want to defend my thesis for me because <laughs> you you would do a great job <laughs> right yeah that was really cool 
Yeah, and, but I could totally hear what you were talking about when you're like, and then he asks a question, and you go to answer it, and you just give him a little bit of information. He's like, well, I, now I have more ideas. And <laughs> I mean, that's just like, that's so cool to be that engaged with what you're talking about that he wants to just consistently know more. Mm-hmm. Plus, like, you guys have an awesome relationship as siblings. <laughs> did that, how did that make you feel when Alan was uh, was so intensely interested in your work? Oh, amazing, for sure. Um, and he was asking such amazing questions. Like, they were they were all pertinent and, like, were, were questions I had definite answers to because I would do this research. And I just really wanted to answer all of them. <laughs> and then he would ask another question. So this the whole interview, I think I said this already, um, lasted an hour. And... At one point, I was like, stop asking questions. I'm going to go back and answer the 10 questions I remember you asking and just like hold it inside if you can, because I know you want these answers and I'll try and keep them short. And then I was able to jump back five and then he couldn't handle it anymore. And he asked me more questions. But that is really stupendous because I've never had a conversation with like that with anyone about my research where he was just so excited to learn more that he like literally couldn't hold it in. First, we'll hear my grandfather, mom and dad, talking about the stresses and strains of a graduate student and their advice for how to keep them all in check. Well, I think there are goals that Kaylee has probably put on herself and others have placed upon her, whether she likes them or not, but there's, there has to be certain things that she needs to achieve in order to continue on in, in this role as her, as her, in her research and the road, the road to the Ph.D., I would think. Uh, it seems like it's a terribly confusing and uh, at the same time maybe exciting because when you think that at some point in time there may be something that she could discover or her team could discover that nobody's known about or could help advance something that somebody does know about. So, like I say, it's probably exciting and complicated at the same time. I think in the academic environment, as a graduate student, there's probably um, a tremendous amount of pressure to produce papers um, to be published, just because in order to get funding, um, you have to be well known. And so if you're not doing work that's not being published, that's not being um, What's the word I'm looking for here, people? Passed out to other people, distributed, distributed out to other people. Then you're you're not really doing work that's being validated outside of your little bubble. Um, and so I think that's probably a big part of it. Um, and so obviously that is a trickle down into what your research is doing and what your research is producing. And um, you know, I really feel though like some of the extraneous stuff that you do with regard to teaching and um, even your own classwork, I sometimes feel is like a secondary thing to, to that. That it's not that your education in the lab is probably paramount to your education outside of the lab. Yeah, I mean, you guys can probably tell that I've talked to my parents quite a bit about the, the role of publishing and how much that influences um, my success as a student and how much that plays into our field. Um, but I definitely think you're nailing it that my role is to be a graduate student and that is to be a researcher predominantly. It is education is something that's supposed to supplement my predominant work in the lab, it's supposed to help me be a better researcher, but not necessarily as a student anymore, uh, where getting grades is you know top priority. So, you know, as you roll into the new year, it's probably a good time to, to pause and reflect on the balance that you're striking in your life. Um, <clears throat> things come up that you're interested in doing and you pursue them, always with a goal of where you want to go, but I think sometimes things get a little out of balance, like your mother was saying. And in these sorts of transitional periods going into the new year, it's a great time to stop and ask yourself, what's the most important thing I should be doing? What should I be spending 80% of my time on? 
while not neglecting the things that are going to help further the career that you want to create for yourself down the road. Mm -hmm. But first and foremost, if you don't take care of the basic things, the first things, none of that other stuff will matter because you won't have the degree behind you. Um, yeah, like you were saying earlier, um, it seems like you're... So who, who did we hear from specifically there? My grandfather was first, and then my mom, and then my dad was at the end. Okay, so uh, two generations of perspective, and they, they both seem uh, keyed in on the, the logistics, the, the um, I want to say, the, yeah, I guess the logistics that you have to deal with. Uh, where you're, you have to balance research and, and classes, and if you're concerned with publishing, then classes are the more important one. And they said, You mean research is a more important one? What did I say? Yeah, you yeah, said classes is, are more important. Yeah, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really, really interesting that they, that they seem to, to really get from you or or because they're paying attention to the wire conversation some of the details of that yeah i mean i'm i'm very fortunate to be able to like talk to my parents and my grandparents fairly regularly and they want to know these things so it makes it really easy to tell them because they're asking these kinds of questions like what do you actually do i really <laughs> tell you what i did this week <laughs> Yeah, and I definitely thought it was very interesting to hear perspectives from three different family members of two different generations. And like y'all had clearly talked about papers and, and, and maybe why you don't, like why classes in grad school aren't necessarily the main thing you focus on. Um, yeah, so that was really interesting to hear. Mm -hmm. yeah, but they, like, they really hit on two things that are sort of like, you know, uh, things that haunt the nightmares of scientists, yeah. <laughs> right? So your grandfather talked about the, you know, how complicated it is, but how excited it is at the same time that there are sort of no guarantees, but the the stakes are really high. You could, you know, make a real impact on the whole world. And then uh, your mom talked about publishing, which is definitely something that that we think about a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a nice segue into our next series. <laughs> right, yeah. Look forward to How to Publish from STEM Culture Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so the other line of thought, which was honestly a lot harder for me to hear, uh, was my family's concerns about me completing my degree, quote unquote, on time, and the impact of my degree following graduation. This audio starts with my grandmother and also has both of my parents. I sometimes worry about where you're going to go with this and that you will spend all this time on an education. And I've heard you say some things before that didn't sound like they would be financially beneficial to you for all the years that you've put in going to school, that, that you would come out making... But which I would hope, after all this, that you would be making a very substantial income. I mean, it, it, because you have such a great knowledge of what you do, um, is that something, when you're doing all this research and you say that's probably not something you're going to continue to do, it's like, really? She spend all this time doing research, and then after all, five years, are you... Are, are you going to just let that go to go a whole different direction? Yeah, so I think one of the things that's really important that I learn during graduate school is not just, oh, I'm learning a lot about breast cancer. That's frankly not the most important thing that I'm doing. It's learning how to become a scientist, right? So use the tools, and moreover, I'm learning how to think through these problems. And it's getting those skills that I think are the most important thing that will be most transferable. And so when I say that I want to go into SciComm with my career goals is that there's no clear cut path. And that's, you know, scary, but it's also, I get to have a bunch of adventures and I won't ever get bored. To me, I just, that's my, probably my biggest concern is that you will be distracted by the next shiny object. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I've seen it kind of play out by saying yes a little bit to a lot of things because you don't want to disappoint anybody on anything or forego something that you find is interesting. The hardest but the most successful path I've ever seen people up beyond is when they say yes to some things and just completely no to some things. Mm -hmm. Not yes a little bit to a lot of things. And that's a personal decision we all have to make. And if you can't make that, you may not have the success in the time frame that you're hoping for. But if you can turn that around and say yes, 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 and no to these things, I think you'll probably move forward faster. So that was really interesting because I think what perhaps isn't clear to them is that in grad school, we already are a lot of different things. We are teachers, we are researchers, and we are scientists. And when it comes to those three things, we also have to be experts in a lot of different things as well. And especially if you don't want to go into academia, you know, those three things aren't enough. You have to also learn how to be a professional and learn how to um, do a lot of other things that grad school doesn't necessarily prepare you for, and you have to go and seek out those opportunities or create them. Yeah, but one of the cool parts about grad school is that uh, because of the freedom that we have, um, you do have oftentimes, and also because of the environment that we're in, uh, you oftentimes have the opportunities to go and seek those uh, those moments of self enrichment uh, in a way that probably you couldn't get in a lot of other places. Yeah. Oh, Sorry, and I was going to respond to to Will's comment there, and that's one of the fun things about grad school is that if you're going to explore careers and other opportunities, now is the time. And even if it might feel like it's kind of maybe taking away from your research. In, in my opinion, we shouldn't only be doing research in grad school. I mean, we're already forced to do classes. <laughs> forced. <laughs> that gives you my perspective on classes. Um, we love class. <laughs> um, but there's so many other things out there that you can do and you get to know other people and, you know, what they do. And it's this freedom to explore. And, and that's why I think a lot of the times I work more than a 40 hour work week is because I am exploring a lot of the other opportunities, but I don't think I'll have the opportunity to do that later on in my career. Yeah. And it's not, it's not exploration like, Oh, we're, you know, reading in textbooks or having people tell us about these things. We actually have opportunities to do them. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely. And I think so they I think they can like kind of realize that this is you have to prep yourself for when you're out of grad school to have like a plan. You can't just like be a ostrich with your head in the ground only doing graduate work and then like emerge and be like, all right, now let's have a job. Obviously, there has to be some prep work to that. But so they have this idea, right? Like, and this is audio I had to cut for time. Um, but we talk about what is the average length of, of grad school. And I asked my family and they were like, well, our only frame of reference is you. So we're going to say five years. I'm like, okay, fair. <laughs> um, and I'm like, well, you know, the, the national average is for biology is somewhere between six and six and a half years. And if you take even into consideration programs that have a full year rotation, and like subtract that out because that's like not time spent doing your your degree uh, that's still like between five and five and a half years and so like I mentioned to them that because my research has been tricky to figure out I might have to push back like a, a semester or so and they immediately see that as like red flags like okay well you have to stop doing all these other things because your research is suffering obviously because you have to push mm. back and I try to explain like no 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 like that's not really the case because like I am I'm doing all these other things because I actually have time because my research is going so terribly <laughs> like I do have time for this and I do make research a priority but they it took a long time and then like dad actually in the conversation like googled what the average time was uh -huh. and it was I actually have this on audio so I'm gonna save this forever where he says I'm right <laughs> <laughs> and he's like yeah you know she's she's telling us how it is and I'm like yeah you know like this is why we have these conversations with our families 
because they don't know all the time. And so they're running around with these preconceived notions of like, oh my gosh, if you slide out a little bit, like that's the end of the world or it means you're doing something wrong or like, bless my grandmother. I love her so dearly, but she thinks I'm going to make all this money. (laughs) But like, there's no way I'm going to make all this money with my degree. Unfortunately, that is not how a PhD usually works. Well, actually, uh, one of my comments uh, about this was... um, directly from my interview with my dad uh, and I can come back and, and we can actually listen to that audio if you guys want to um, but I can tell you what he said basically is that once you've got your PhD you will have lots of job opportunities whether they're exactly the job opportunities that you thought you were gonna have when you started out uh, once you've got your PhD you've got your working papers is mm-hmm. how he puts it it's sort of like the union card of yesteryear, unfortunately, I guess. Um, but no, I mean, uh, you know, when I when I asked him sort of if he was concerned for my future, he said, no, I'm not at all. Because, I mean, and, and that's coming from a person who did this, but also has trained PhDs for 30 years. Yeah. And they all get jobs. Yeah. Whether okay. they get jobs in academia or at, tech companies or, you know, doing SciComm. I mean, I think even now, PhDs get jobs. Mm-hmm. I'm going to play this for my family later. <laughs> Proof! <laughs> Could you also give us just a brief background of your grandparents and your parents' like work experience? or Because um, none of them have gone to grad school, is that right? Well, my mom has her MBA, okay. uh, which she finished when she had me. So I clearly am the golden ticket. <laughs> Um, to that, but my dad worked uh, for a life insurance company doing information system security, so a lot of like tech stuff for mm-hmm. thirty years. Okay. So he's got a pretty healthy understanding. He's actually helped me navigate a lot of like interpersonal skills because he developed a lot of those. And in tech, it was really interesting to hear his perspective. Uh, my mom ran an at-home business for most of my my youths, um, <laughs> and both of my grandparents. Um, they, they neither of them would actually went to college, um, but my grandfather worked in medical sales for his career, and my grandmother did a variety of things, usually at like schools. So she worked as like a nurse type aid thing. Yeah, yeah. So from from their perspective, it might be more like, oh, well, you train for this job and then you have this job, right? Yeah, and yeah. then f- grad school is very much not that way. You, we do we train ourselves and we get trained in certain techniques but the whole grad school experience is about like you were saying about training to be a scientist which is really broad and depending on what kind of scientist and what kind of job you want you might have different focuses mm-hmm. yeah yeah so that was a really thank you very much for sharing that with us that was good yeah, thanks for listening <laughs> <clears throat> One theme that was clear in all of our interviews is that our families really care deeply about us and want the best for us. We're all super lucky to have families like this, um, and that can make all the difference in the world, especially in graduate school, which can be incredibly demanding. And if you don't have a supportive family, you may have friends that you've chosen as your family that care about you deeply. If you want to hear more about friends in graduate school and building a support system, you can check out our episode two on grad interactions. So our experiment didn't go exactly as we planned because families are probably more complicated than science. Mm. But the experiment was worthwhile nonetheless. Uh, Say la science, such as science. (laughs) Um, We heard that our families have different attitudes and understandings of what we do. But uh, more importantly, we heard about what our families really care about. They want to know, are we happy? Are we taken care of? Do we have a secure future? Thank you so much for listening. Next time, we'll be talking about writing and science, where Zach, Danny, and Kaylee will be kicking off our third series on how to publish. They will be talking about how to do goodly at science writing. (laughs) We are on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as STEM Culture, one word, podcast. Visit our website at stemculturepodcast.com for show notes, references, and information about our guests and contributors. Please leave us a review or five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. 
Until next time, don't forget to consensually hug a grad student, or at least buy them a coffee or a London Fog tea latte, lightly sweetened. How big would a griffin's wings need to be? Yeah. So, like, um, let's assume that a griffin is the size of a lion. Yeah, with but hollow bones like a bird. Yes, but it has also evolved to... Um, I have an idea. Shoot. So, you know how with birds, they look so fluffy, you think their bodies are actually way bigger? So you know how when you look at a bird and you're like, oh, that bird like looks pretty big. But then when you actually look at the bones, it's super tiny. So mm-hmm. what if a griffin, what we're seeing of the griffin. It's like is, fluff, like it's a chinchilla. Like, it's like a fucking fluff ball of fluff. So, and, and like they're made to look bigger, so they're more intimidating. And like, yeah, it's really but then just if you actually ploy. touched one, you'd be like, you're literally all fluff. 